what I will talk about is, uh, I've mentioned the magic wand approach. I always take this when I'm looking at designing anything, building anything. I always start with most optimal, pretend there's no constraints. So what I'll talk about here will be presenting a list of things that I believe to be most optimal. And we'll go from there. I'll show you how they all tie together in the end. So let's start with uh, SQL Server. It, it really has only three resources to work with. Um, I'm deliberately excluding network. Uh, we don't have much control over that, and, and usually that's more of an impact on uh, uh, data transfer latency than anything else. So we'll focus on CPU, memory, and disk. Um, SQL Server over the years um, has changed quite a lot. It's gotten much better at, at managing its own resources. It used to be you had a lot of control over, over or you had to kind of indirectly control some things, uh, particularly uh, memory utilization. It has, uh, especially since 2005, it's, it's done a much better job, and a lot of that is kind of a moot point, uh, best left alone. So let's talk about processors. Um, again, we don't have a lot of direct control over this other than our max stop settings. Um, we do have some indirect control on how we encourage uh, the SQL Server engine to parallelize and thereby take advantage of all the available processors and cores. Um, as always, um, you'll hear this a lot, everything, almost everything I'm going to talk about has to do with resource contention. So in the case of a CPU, the probably worst case scenario is to run something like uh, reporting services where you have people generating reports at the same time you're trying to execute uh, queries or do your daily uh, OLTP uh, functions. Um, so let's go into our memory. About one screen here. So memory relative to disk, um, blazing fast. And SQL Server is really good at, at uh, capturing memory. It's really bad at releasing it back to the operating system. It is uh, anything that can be done in memory is going to be very fast. If you have to exit from memory or force SQL Server to page or, or go back to disk or, you know, because you're, it's under memory pressure and it's uh, pushing pages, you know, cache pages out of, di out of memory, uh, you're really going to slow the machine down. So that's one of the points that we'll talk about is how to how to not overload the memory. Um, disk, same story. Uh, disks, disks are the slowest piece of the entire infrastructure. They are notoriously, uh, well, just painfully slow relative to memory. You, know, you can be talking a factor of you know, at least 10, if not 50 or 100. It's, um, kind of depends on how you have your disk configured and such. So a lot of what I'll talk about today has to do with disks and what you do with your disks, how you place your data on the disks, um, how you fill files on the disks, and, and optimizing from that standpoint. Change screens here real quick. So relative to, to uh, The uh, SQL Server configuration itself, um, actually, let me talk about the operating system really quick. Um, some people say this doesn't make a big difference. Um, it would if you, this has to do with page files, the operating system page file. Um, I'm a firm believer that, that every object, whether it's you know, the operating system or SQL Server data files or whatever, they need their own space to play. You put anything else in there and you're going to create some contention and it's usually at exactly the wrong time. So I'm a firm believer in creating uh, a page file outside of the operating system space. Um, if you can, put it on a, on a disk that the operating system is not on. If you can't, then partition the, uh, the operating system disk and again give it its own place to play as a rule. I always set the min and max, the initial size and max size to the same and leave it alone. You know, give it its space and don't mess with it. And you'll hear me say that a lot about a lot of the uh, 
uh, SQL Server objects as well. So for anyone that's not familiar with uh, partitions, um, what it does is it, it will take your disk and create you know, logical work areas. Um, they'll show up as a drive in, in uh, your uh, uh, Explorer. So it will treat it exactly as though if you look at your disk manager, it'll look just exactly like another disk, except you'll see that you have more than one logical disk on a physical disk. Okay, back to the uh, back to the page file again. So, um, again, if you Windows will probably complain if you try to move it. Actually, I know it will complain if you try to move it off of the C drive. It's going to tell you that well, if you have a crash, you it may not. Uh, uh, it probably won't give you a dump file. Um, truly, I have not seen that happen very often, and the days of blue screens are pretty much behind us. So, for the most part, I tend to ignore that. So here, looking at uh, Disk Manager, this is what, at worst case, I would do. Um, I'll create a uh, uh, partition on the same drive, my boot drive, operating system, and then put the uh, page file by itself. And in my case, it's barely bigger than the, uh, only slightly larger than the page file itself. As far as page file sizes go, there's a whole lot of discussion on that. Um, they, I think the general rule, and what I've I've never had an issue exceeding a uh, using the one and a half factors. But when you get up, you know, when you start talking, you know, 16 gigs or or more, uh, it seems reasonable to drop that back to you know, barely like 1.1 times the uh, uh, your memory space. Uh, max degree of parallelism, for anyone that doesn't know where it is, um, server properties, you right click on the server and there's your number down here towards the bottom of the list. So setting that tells it how many, uh, how many threads to spin up on a, on a, I'm sorry, how many processors to use for a particular query. 